Are you a serious dinosaur collector that wants to make better buying decisions? If so, this is the show for you. Welcome to episode 11 of the Dinosaur Review Show. Today we're going to be talking about Pentaceratops, a ceratopsian or horned dinosaur from the early Cretaceous. It lived in North America, so it's very close to home to us. It is one of the relatives of Triceratops, which is really cool because this is one of my personal favorites. Today we have four figures to look at, including two from GR Toys Hallengood. We just added the Hallengood line to Happy Hen Toys, so we are excited to take a look at them. So let's start with the Papo figure first though, George. Let's take a look at our Pentaceratops from Papo. Oh my goodness, this, look at the detail work on this dinosaur. It is just superb. I will wanna point out that one of the main things about Pentaceratops where it gets its name is Penta means five and Ceratops means horned face. So when paleontologists first discovered this, they thought it had five horns, but these are actually osteoderms all around the frill. Osteoderms are bony plates. And looking at these, these are really well sculpted. It really shows the ornamental nature of these. Uh, they wouldn't have been very good for the fence as much as the bigger horns. And speaking of the bigger horns, you can see little crack details. I really like those. And the head sculpt is very, very accurate. Moving on to the arms, I see they have the right amount of hoofed toes, but they did add a little hoof on that one. We're not entirely sure whether they had kind of a keratinous sheath over those, but everything looks good so far. It might be missing just one little nub in here. In the back, we have the three main toes and then the inner toe. That's very, very good. This hump, however, I've never really seen that in um, Pentaceratops. It's kind of a very much like an Acrocanthosaurus, which we reviewed not too long ago, but it has these these spikes, which I also didn't know if, whether they had them or not, but fossil evidence shows that they probably didn't. So coming on to the back part of the tail, I like that they made it nice and short. Believe it or not, Ceratopsians have pretty short tails. And looking at the back, no cloaca, but that's all right. <laughs> this is a beautiful figure. They even have paint in the back of the frill. Usually this part's kind of neglected in dinosaur figures, so I really like that. Not to be biased, but I have this one in my personal collection. You mentioned the five horns that really aren't five horns, but there are two horns on the side of its face. Are those counted as the horns? They are more prominent than they would have been in other ceratopsians, which is how it got its name, Pentaceratops, but these do not count as uh, horns, since in order to be horns, they have to be at the top of the head. These were on the side, and they were part of its skull and mandibular structure. So there are actually muscle attachments that connect the lower jaw to this. It's kind of like uh, our cheekbones, how they connect our muscles in our jaw to our skull and as an anchoring point. So this, tri uh, this ceratopsian would have had a very strong bite, almost like scissors. Is the beak correct on this model? It is correct. One of the things that I personally don't like in when I see reconstructions of ceratopsians is how much of the beak goes into the face. Whereas in life, it probably would have been covered mostly by skin. If you look at birds or even other reptiles, they only have the tip of the beak exposed with a keratinous sheath, which this one does. And you can see that kind of fading into the darker color. Um, so I would say it's very accurate. You can even see teeth. It's so cool. Nice. And that figure also stands. In real life, do you anticipate that they would have stood on their hind legs like that in a battle stance? They could have. A lot of animals rear up on their hind legs to appear larger, and it can be a defense mechanism if the horns and the frill don't work. I also want to point out that if you put it down, it also can stand on four legs like it's lifting one paw. Yeah, it's a good pose. Mm -hmm. I'd say I, re I really like this one. <laughs> Again, we have the bias of George owning this one, so we'll see. We'll, we'll see if we can knock it off its pedestal, though. All right, let's move on to the two models from Hell and Good GR Toys, and they are the same model. They just come in different paint colors. All right, let's take a look. Here's the first one, and then here this is the second one. Let's have them kind of face off like rivals. Oh my goodness, the colors on these are first thing that pop out to me and I really like how it's just not one color but a combination of different colors I will say this one is really really bright probably a much younger individual typically colors tend to mellow out as you get older in a lot of um well 
I was gonna say birds, but birds are also very colorful. But this frill definitely would have been a big piece of real estate to advertise how attractive or healthy you are to others of your kind. Now, the cheekbones that we were looking at in the Papa figure uh, bend forward, but these are bending backwards. So it's more akin to what we see in Triceratops versus Pentaceratops. So I'm, uh, I'm interested that they went with this choice. Neither of them are proved wrong or correct because there is such thing as fossil deformation. So fossils can bend in, in the rock, unfortunately. But let's take a closer look at their feet. These guys have the right amount of toes. Remember the, the one that I said was missing on the other figure? That's that little pinky here in the back. Barely noticeable. But then you have the other four, which do have hooves. The last one should not because it we don't find that kind of hoof preserved. And typically things like hooves that are covered in hard material do preserve. Uh, same thing back here. You've got four, the three main ones and the one that's the inner toe. And wouldn't you know it? Look at that. It has a cloaca. It's always a nice little feature to have on a dinosaur. But if you look at the back of these two figures, they are very chunky. I mean, look at those rolls. <laughs> Man, that is one chunky pentaceratops. I know I actively speak out against shrink wrapping and they definitely cover their bases here on the skull. The beak is very accurate, uh, enclosed. The other one was open and it doesn't seem to have any inaccuracies that I can find so far. They did add osteoderms on the back, which is a, a neat little detail. But I gotta say, they also did not neglect the back of the frill. The paint schemes on these are very consistent with the patterning. But yeah, I'd say these are, these are amazing. You said these are from Holland Good? Holland Good. Well, they did very good. <laughs> All right, we have one final figure to take a look at. We've been getting a lot of viewer requests for Beasts of the Mesozoic. So we have one Pentaceratops figure from BOM. So let's take a look at that next. Take a minute to appreciate just how large this figure is. This thing's a monster. It is huge, and actually the tail comes separately in the box and needs to be assembled by the user. Let's take a closer look at this beast of the Mesozoic. My goodness, I think I might have to adjust the camera for this one. Look at this Pentaceratops. It is a little different from the other figures we've reviewed so far. This one has articulation, which means it has jointed pieces that move. It not only has articulation on the limbs, but it also has articulation in the head. Let's see, does the mouth open? Oh, it does, and it closes. So this figure has it all when it comes to articulation. Even the back and the neck can articulate. Look at that. Let's take a look at the head of this figure. The Pentaceratops here has backward facing cheekbones, just like the previous Halong Good figure. And oh, do we not love a dinosaur that can open and close its mouth. Look at that. That is a very nice detailed beak. Just the right curvature, both top and bottom. If you look at the horns, they are beautifully sculpted. Not as much texture as the others, but still very nice. And if we look at the frill, this frill does have those classic pointing down um, osteoderms from the top and the outward pointing ones. Now let's look at the feet. Do we have the right amount of toes? Yes, we do. Oh, two little nubbins in the back and the three hooked ones in the front. That's what I like to see in my Ceratopsians. Let's look in the back and oh, wow, they are doing great so far. They have four toes in the back, three of the main ones and one of the inner ones, although they seem to be the same size. Now, as we did mention earlier, the tail does come separate. So it would go like this and it has 360 degrees of motion, which is pretty nice. Now let's see if they have cloacas. No cloaca, that's all right. Not all the figures have them, but it's a nice detail to have. And speaking of details to have, I do want to point out that these little circles on the scales are osteoderms that we have found preserved in some Triceratops skin. So this is kind of like a, well, if Triceratops had them, then maybe Pentaceratops also had them. So it's kind of a nice little detail to see. I got to say, I'm liking this kind of tiger pattern too. <laughs> it looks very very beasty, as their name suggests. I did want to check inside. We weren't able to do this with the other figures since its mouth didn't open, but if you look closely, you can see teeth in there. That is a nice detail. Now, I can't really see if the teeth are accurate, but you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna put a microscope up to this. This dinosaur is amazing. Not just in size, but also, wow. 
it's huge. You can even see the, the nostril flare there. The more I look at it, the more I find. I gotta say, this is truly an impressive figure. All right, George, mugshot time. Let's take a look at the head side by side. Okay, well, I gotta say all of them did good, but there were some differences in the skulls, as we can see with the pepo cheekbones. They're facing forward instead of backwards. I do want to say that I love the pepo horn texture. It looks very aged and cracked, like it's been used. It's not a brand new horn. This dinosaur has been through a lot. Uh, the other figures from Halong Good and Beast of the Mesozoic are a little too smooth for my taste. And if you look at animals with horns or antlers, they always have some battle damage. So big fan of battle damage. I will say that the beaks are fairly consistent all throughout, but the ones after the popo have better proportions. I'm now noticing that the, the top beak is a little bit bigger than the bottom beak and the other figures, but in the pepo pentaceratops, they seem to be closer in size, which it isn't that noticeable, but it is something that can be noticed. Frills are amazing, all well painted. I, I'd say you wouldn't lose out whichever one you pick. So George, you looked at the frills and thought that they look good from a design and color perspective. There's different shapes on them though. Do we know what shape it would be? Were they longer and narrower or were they, they thicker and wider? Most of the fossils that we see have them longer and narrower, but it could be an effect of the fossilization process because things get compressed. And a lot of times it's laterally because the animal's laying on its side. So the frills get kind of squished and sometimes elongated, but with reconstructions and art, they tend to widen them out because if they were compressed and they had to have been a little bit wider. So it's a combination of both. The fossils are long and extended, but in life they probably would have been wider. And then one final question on the frills. We see quite a variation in the osteoderms on the different models. Would there be any indication as to which of the osteoderm patterns is more correct on these? That's a difficult question because sometimes osteoderms get lost. The Papa one does have smaller osteoderms than the other ones. This one is probably more faithful to the fossil, but as we know, the fossil isn't an indicator of how it would look like in real life exactly because these osteoderms would have had an extra layer of keratin and that extra layer of keratin would have made the osteoderms longer and their horns as well. So I'd say something like the Beast of the Mesozoic one will be a lot more accurate. They're longer, they're sharper, and they're more well-defined. All right. Do we have fossilized osteoderms? Yes, we do have fossilized osteoderms. They fossilize sometimes with the keratin sheath, and sometimes that keratin sheath uh, wears away. Let's take a look at the skin and scales. Yes, yeah, so um, I got to say that the... One with the best scales has to be the Holland Good figure. Those little osteoderms that I noticed in the Beast of the Mesozoic one are also on the Holland Good one that I am just now noticing because of the lighting change. These also have the right patterning on the belly scales. The bottoms of the Holland Good figures have more square scales and they turn around as you go up to the top of the body. So that is very much like preserved skin from Triceratops that we have found. And as you know, Triceratops is the most well-known of their family. But that also doesn't mean that that was the rule for all of them. They might have had different skin patterns. But I'd say that uh, Holland Good model did really good <laughs> on, on those scales. The Papa one, it looks more like elephant skin with those striations and wrinkles. But, you know, it is it is a good texturing. It's a very detailed figure. So I, I really like that. But Beasts of the Mesozoic, they are consistent. The same scale pattern is used throughout, and you gotta love consistency, especially in figures that may seem to forget details. But my top choice for skin would be the Halong Good. All right, George, let's take a look at the belly side by side. Oh man, I do love a chunky dinosaur, and three of those fit that bill. Papo, I'm so sorry. Well, Halong Good, they're very chunky. They're very even throughout in their, their bellies. They have this skin wrinkle texture that I really, really like. That is a nice detail to add. The Beast of the Mesozoic is very solid. It's a unit. <laughs> it is one of the most sturdy looking dinosaurs I've ever seen. The proportions seem just about right. Okay, George, decision time. Assuming money is no object, which figure are you going to add to your collection? Please forgive me, Popo Pentaceratops, but the Holland Good. Not the Beast of the Mesozoic? See, I I like I personally like scaling my dinosaurs, so I'd like a dinosaur that 
is the same size relatively in scale to my other dinosaurs. But if I wanted a, a display piece to like really pop out, I'd get the Beast of the Mesozoic. But I'd say that's a little too big for me. What do you think of the articulation on the Beast of the Mesozoic figure? Is it a gimmick or do you really like it? Oh, I really like it. Now, that being said, I have not liked articulation in other dinosaur figures before, but Beast of the Mesozoic does it right. They have the articulation points in all the right places that you would want in a dinosaur, and with that anatomic accuracy. That's something you don't really find in other dinosaur toys that do articulation in places where a dinosaur should not bend. Um, I'm not going to say any names, but if you just go to a, any toy store and you see some dinosaurs with articulation, odds are they're not going to be the most anatomically correct with those articulations but um i think beast of the mesozoic did a really good job of that so one final decision then george since you picked the model from hollandgood which color are you going to pick oh always with the hard decisions yellow was never really my favorite color so i'm gonna go with this guy you've talked a lot about camouflage and i would think the darker colors would have blended more with its natural habitat you'd be correct this Pentaceratops coloration would probably be more well adapted to being out in nature. This one would stick out like a sore thumb and be an easy meal. Now, if this was maybe a seasonal change, some birds change colored feathers depending on the season uh, to attract mates. This could be believable, but only for that short season. If it carried this color throughout its whole life, it probably wouldn't have survived very well. All right, the expert has spoken. We're going with the darker colored Hollandgood model as the most scientifically accurate. And that concludes this episode. Thank you for watching and we'll see you on the next one.